I'm a scientist, and my company builds online software that analyzes DNA for drug resistance testing. And most of my friends are in creative professions, because this is Cape Town. And that means when I tell people what I do at dinner parties, they go, uh-huh. And then they usually turn and speak to the person on the opposite side to them. And as you can imagine, that hurts me. It hurts my feelings, but it also upsets me, because I really believe that drug resistance is one of the greatest challenges, if not the greatest challenge, facing our generation, and yet no one will ask me what it is. Except Ted, thankfully. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so of your time explaining in as simple terms as I can what drug resistance is and what we can do about it. And I'm going to do that by means of three journeys. And because today's theme is Likleyesha, it is time. For our first journey, we're going to do a bit of time travel. That was Cape Town in the year 1900. I'd like to transport you back there, and I'd like you to put yourself somewhere in that scene. And I'd like you to ask yourselves just one question. If it's the year 1900, and I'm the age that I am now, what are the chances that I'd still be alive today? It's a tough question. I can't answer it for all of you, we don't have time, but I can give you some numbers that might help you decide. Today, in 2016, the global average life expectancy is 71. 71 years old, not a bad age to get to. Back then, in the year 1900, the global average life expectancy was 30. 30 years old. I'm 30 years old. So clearly, something really extraordinary has happened in the last just over 100 years to more than double the global average life expectancy. And in order to unpack what that might be, we might ask ourselves another very simple question. What were people dying of in the year 1900? Tuberculosis? Pneumonia? Diarrhea? Those are the three leading causes of death globally in the year 1900. Now, you might notice a thread that binds those three diseases together. They are all infectious diseases, all communicable. Now, let's fast forward to 2016 and ask ourselves, what are people dying of today? Heart disease, cancer, stroke. Three leading causes of death globally, globally, in 2016. All non-infectious, non-communicable diseases. So we know that the global average life expectancy has more than doubled in the last 100 years, and we have a clue that it must have something to do with our ability to control infectious diseases. And we'd be right. Massive improvements have been made in our ability to control infectious diseases just in the last 100 years or so. We're much, much better at sanitation. We're much better at hygiene. We have much better work conditions. But perhaps most simply, we figured out what causes infectious diseases. Spoilers, viruses and bacteria. That is roughly what a bacteria looks like. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to lump viruses and bacteria together, and we're going to pretend that they all look a little bit like this. <laughs> I told you I was going to do this as simply as I can, so there will be cartoons. Because we figured out what causes infectious diseases, we could also figure out how to cure infectious diseases. And we did. We invented antimicrobial drugs, antibiotics, antiviral drugs. That, unsurprisingly, is what an antimicrobial drug looks like. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to pretend it looks a bit like this. <laughs> so I think, as a society, we've been telling this story to ourselves as we invented antibiotics, we more than doubled the global average life expectancy, we cured infectious diseases, and we won, and we're done. And nothing could be further from the truth. And in order to tell you why, I'm going to have to take you on our second journey. I want to transport you out of the year 1900. I want to shrink you right down, and I want to take you inside the human body, inside the body of a person who's just taken 
an antimicrobial drug. And I'm going to phrase what happens here in terms of a war. On one side is a teeming horde of bacteria and viruses whose only aim is to infect your body and take it over for their own ends, mostly just to replicate themselves. And on the other side, the few, the brave, the antimicrobial drug. <laughs> so now let's imagine that this body that we're in has an infected wound. And let's, for the purposes of analogy, pretend that penicillin is a spear. Nice, simple, effective antibiotic. We send our penicillin spears out into the battlefield of your body, and they decimate the enemy population. And they do this over and over again in bodies all over the world for years. And that would be an unmitigated success if the picture I'd just shown you was correct. But it's not. Just like I have green eyes, and you have blue eyes, and you have brown eyes, all bacteria and viruses, even within a species, are just a little bit different. So the picture looks a bit more like this. And in particular, we might imagine that in our infected wound, just a few of the bacteria are different from the others in a way that gives them a little bit of defense against penicillin. A little bit of, here's the key word, resistance to penicillin. Let's say that just a few bacteria have a shield, for example. Then, when we send out our penicillin spear troops into the battlefield of your body, all the other bacteria are decimated, but the bacteria with shields survive. And not only do they survive, they reproduce. And suddenly, our penicillin spears don't work anymore. That's natural selection, that's evolution, and that's drug resistance. But we're resourceful as a species, and particularly in war, we like to up the ante. It's what we do, unfortunately. And so we build bigger spears, and we think, hey, we've solved the problem. Just a few years, bacteria and viruses develop bigger shields, and we're right back where we started. We bring a gun to the fight. <laughs> bacteria develop bulletproof vests. <laughs> we bring a bomb. Bacteria build bomb shelters. We're in a position now where if you walk into a clinic with an infected wound or a sore throat or TB or HIV, we can't be completely sure if we're dealing with a common or garden shield-carrying bacteria or the bacteria or viral equivalent of Iron Man. <laughs> so we don't know whether we can send out a cost-effective spear-like antimicrobial troop, or a very expensive, extremely side-effect-prone rocket launcher. This arms race has been going on for over half a century, and the bad news is we're losing. We've already discovered strains of bacteria that are resistant to every antibiotic currently on the market. We can't make drugs fast enough to keep fighting this war just by trying to get stronger and stronger. So we need to get a little bit smarter. To stretch this analogy to the very limits of its usefulness, we need some intelligence. We need a spy. <laughs> we need a spy that can go behind enemy lines in your body, check out all the artillery, and report back to us exactly which antimicrobial soldiers we should be sending out into that battlefield in order to make you well. And that is a drug resistance test. This is what we do for a living. This is what my company builds. I'd like to take this down to earth for you for just a second. And in order to do that, I need to take you on a third journey. I'd like to transport you out of the human body, grow you back up to human size, and put you in a much more prosaic location. I'd like to put you in the well-worn shoes of a doctor in a rural hospital somewhere in South Africa who has just diagnosed a patient with tuberculosis. Just diagnosed a patient with tuberculosis. Without access to a cost-effective drug resistance test, 
that doctor's only recourse is to send that patient back out into the community with the drugs that they hope will work. That they hope will work. And if they work, that's great. But if they don't, that patient will be coughing on the street, coughing on the bus, coughing at work, coughing in church, coughing in their homes, and spreading drug-resistant Iron Man TB through their community, and potentially, eventually, rendering entire classes of antimicrobial drug obsolete. This has happened before in medical history, and it can happen again. The scale at which drug resistance can spread, and the scale at which it can kill, is almost unimaginable. It's estimated that in just the next 35 years, the number of people who will die prematurely from a drug-resistant infection is 300 million. That's 300 million people who are going to die of a disease that you think we already cured. But this doesn't have to be the future that we give our children. There is a lot that we can do to fight drug resistance and keep that global average life expectancy going up. We can stop needlessly prescribing so many antibiotics. We can invest in developing new antibiotics and new antiviral drugs. And we can do drug resistance testing. Because I don't believe that we should feel comfortable complacently spreading ideas in here when we're needlessly spreading disease out there. Thank you very much.